Today, there are around 5,000 named varieties of wine grapes in the world. Perhaps 40 have unrecognizable flavor and character. All over the old world of wine growing, the natural selection of the variety that does best and gives the best quality combined with reasonable quantity and a reasonable resistance to disease has taken place gradually over centuries. In many places, no one variety provides exactly what is needed to produce wine. The tradition is either to grow a number together or to grow them separately and blend the resulting wine. In the new world, the choice of grapes is not a question of tradition but of judgment, a balance of quality, quantity, hardiness, and fashion. The most well known grape varieties include Riesling, the classic German grape. Riesling is a modest bearer and ripens late, but can make the ultimate honeyed, delicate, flower scented nectar. This grape Has also been successful in Australia and in California. Cabernet Sauvignon, a small, tough skinned grape that gives the distinction to the red wines of Bordeaux. Although always blended with Merlot and sometimes Malbec, Cabernet Sauvignon is widely planted in Australia, where its best wine needs long aging. Also in South Africa and in California. Where it has scored its greatest success outside of France. Chardonnay is the white grape of Burgundy and Champagne. It gives a firm, full, strong wine with scent and character on chalky soils, becoming almost luscious without being sweet. This grape is very successful in coastal California, parts of Australia, New Zealand, Bulgaria, and in recent times, Italy and Spain. Muscat. This grape is easy to recognize by its taste and smell. Either black or white muscat spread from the Aegean with civilization to the Crimea, Sicily, Italy, and southern Spain. Muscat wine, with some exceptions, is sweet. Pinot Noir, the single red grape of the Cote d'Or in Burgundy. In Champagne, it is pressed before fermentation to make white wine. Which becomes the greater part of the best champagnes. At its best, the scent, flavor, body, and texture of its wine are all profound pleasures. Sauvignon Blanc. This is the chief white Bordeaux grape, used with Semillon and a little Muscadel to make dry Grave and sweet Sauterne. Sauvignon Blanc also makes an interesting, clean, lighter wine on its own and elsewhere. In the wines of Puy and Sancerre in the Loire and throughout Touraine, near Chablis, and in Italy, Chile, and California. Semillon. This grape has the great gift shared with Riesling of rotting nobly. Under certain conditions of warmth and humidity, a normally undesirable fungus softens the skin and lets the juice evaporate, concentrating the sugar and flavoring elements and producing a luscious, creamy wine. The great golden wines of Sautern are made like this. On a vineyard, there is a job indoors in the cellar and a job outdoors in the vines for every day of the winemaker's year. The life in a year of a typical French vineyard starts in January with pruning. Traditionally, pruning started on St. Vincent's Day, January the 22nd. Nowadays, it starts in December. If there is no snow, the ground is often frozen. Vines will survive temperatures down to minus 18 degrees centigrade. Barrels of wine from the previous harvest must be kept full to the top. And their bungs wiped every other day with a solution of sulfur dioxide. In fine, dry weather, bottling of older wines will be carried out. In February, as pruning is completed, cuttings are taken for grafting. 
the vineyard machinery is clean and prepared for the outdoor work of the new season. The racking of the new wine into clean barrels starts in February. The new wine is assembled in a vat to equalize the casks. About mid-March, the vine begins to emerge from dormancy. Sap begins to rise and the brown sheaths on the buds fall off. The soil will be worked for the first time to aerate it and to uncover the bases of the vines. The first racking will be completed by the end of the month and the wine is continually topped up in the casks. In April, ploughing is finished and the smell of burning fills the air as waste prunings and replaced rotten stakes are burnt. Year-old cuttings are planted from the nursery. As 5% of the wine evaporates through the wooden sides of the barrel every year, known as the angel's share, the casks are once again topped up to prevent any empty space occurring. Frost danger is at its height in May. On clear nights, stoves may be needed among the vines. The soil is worked for the second time to kill weeds, and the vines are sprayed against oedium and mildew. Towards the end of May, just before the vines flower, the second racking off the leaves into clean barrels will take place. The vines will flower at the beginning of June when the temperature reaches 18 to 20 degrees centigrade. The weather at this time of year is critical. The warmer and calmer, the better. Following flowering, the shoots are thinned and the best ones are tied to the vines. As the second racking of the new wine is completed, natural evaporation is accelerated by the warm weather. It is therefore essential to check the casks for any weeping from between the staves. In July, the vines are once again sprayed against diseases. The soil is cultivated for the third time to prevent weeds growing. No shipping takes place in hot weather as all efforts are channeled into keeping the cellar cool. August's outdoor activities include trimming the vines and keeping the vineyards free from weeds. This is the month that all the equipment used for the vintage will be checked and prepared. The vats and casks will be inspected for use during the vintage. Vine growth and fermentation starts again about mid-month, so bottling must stop. About the third week of September, once the grapes are ripe, the vintage begins. Just prior to the vintage, the fermenting vats are filled with water to swell the wood and make them perfectly tight. The vintage will continue for perhaps the first two weeks of October. On its completion, the vineyard is manured with the pressed grape skins. Land dedicated for new plantations will be deep ploughed. The new wine is fermenting as the year-old wine is racked for the final time and the barrels moved to a second-year cellar. In November, the vineyard is ploughed to move the soil over the bases of the vines to protect them from frost. Wine to be bottled is racked and fined. This is a process of filtering the wine using egg white. If the vintage was a good one, the new wine will be racked or left for another month if it was a poor vintage. The cycle of events has neared its full circle as winter pruning starts around mid-December. Tasting starts on the new wines and the bottling of the old wine continues. Throughout the year, the greatest challenge for the wine grower is the weather. In Northern Europe, the weather is always uncertain. At any time of year, it can have an effect for good or ill on the vine and its grapes. While the vine lies dormant in the winter, there is the possibility of frost, which can come too in the spring. If a frost comes after the vital budding time, it can destroy the crop before it ever even appears. 
In the hundred days that it takes a vine to bear ripe grapes from the time of flowering, the weather is of the utmost importance. There must be sun, but not only sun. A little rain is needed, but at the right times. Some early morning mist is helpful, but not too much. Really heavy rain can be disastrous. Hail can destroy everything, even the vines themselves. There is nothing the grower can do about any of these things. He may see everything ripening to perfection with day after cloudless day of sunshine, and only rain on the days he has to stay indoors to do his accounts. Or he may have to stand helpless with tears in his eyes as he sees hail tearing his beloved vines apart. The wine grower is a farmer. And a farmer learns patience by bitter experience, but one must not be too sorrowful. Can there be any more satisfying, natural way of life than tending vines and making wine?